do some preliminary announcements. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for the gift of your church. We thank you for the gift of your spirit as it descends upon us this Sunday. But help us always be mindful and responsive to those in need and to remember that we must one day give account of the gifts and graces that you have bestowed upon us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. For those of you who do not know me, I am Canon Kevin Huddleston. I am the Canon for Finance and Administration for the Diocese of uh, Milwaukee. And of, as of June 1st, I will be full time with the diocese. There was an announcement that went out yesterday. And then um, also Scott Leanna will be the Canon for Ministry. So we have two Canons and working with Bishop Lee. Sarah Bittner is the Director of Communications for the Diocese and moderating the chat room and all those kinds of things tonight. Uh, a couple of announcements I wanna make uh, to begin with. One, this is our last session of Wardens and Treasurers for this go around. We'll start again in September. Uh, I, you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but I just assume that in the summertime, not a lot of people wanna be inside at seven o'clock uh, watching a Zoom meeting on Thursday nights. <laughs> so we we will come back in September and we'll publish a list of the topics that we're going through. Uh, Bishop Lee and I are working on some ideas and some things that he would like us to cover this coming year. So keep that in mind. Um, also, I'll just throw it out a reminder to the wardens and uh, vestry members to make sure that you've got your deputies signed up for the convention on June 26th when we elect Bishop Lee, our provisional bishop. Um, it will be a Zoom meeting and probably will not be very long. It will probably be half an hour to maybe an hour at the most. I, I'm thinking it's not gonna be that long. So, um, but anyway, keep that in mind. So I'm assuming you were here because you wanna know how to broke proof your budget. So let me share my screen. I'll go through my, some of my slides and talk. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them as they come along. Or Sarah, you, if there's something pertaining because I'm not looking at the chat, you can interrupt me and make sure. So let's begin with know your numbers. And just for that, uh, one of the things I need you to know or wanted you to know is that I just received the quarter one report from uh, the Unstuck group, which is a group that uh, polls about 120,000 churches across the United States on a quarterly basis. And they give different uh, information about ministry and other things. But the financial information was really interesting because this is kind of as we're coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic that was really interesting to see about the numbers with regard to finances. And the good news is the giving has increased by 1.2% on average. However, the bad news is that the number of giving units has decreased by 6%, which means that our people are being much more faithful in giving, but we have less of them giving. So that's something to be attuned at, and you can watch that in your own parish. Churches average about 22 weeks of cash reserves. No surprise, expenses are down. It's recommended that you have 12 to 15 of cash reserves in your um, savings for rainy days. And I keep telling people that COVID-19 counts as a rainy day. So if you don't have that, that's okay because you should have used it. Churches are on the top of the financial investment with regard to salaries. Most churches, 55% of their budget is in salaries. Um, the common thing from the Episcopal uh, Church Foundation is that a recommended level is 45 to 50%. I know that that doesn't always work, especially in smaller churches. The, uh, another good news is that churches are continuing to reduce their debt, which is great. So those are some numbers that kind of let you know where you stand within the life of the church, big C with everyone in the nation, and you can compare your numbers to that. 
So why do you need to know the numbers? And this is, you know, the treasurers know this, but I'm speaking particularly to wardens and uh, vestry members, is you can't advocate ultimate financial leadership to the bookkeeper or a finance team, refusing to deal with the real world operational problems it is the vestry's job to step up and lead spiritually and financially at this time. And I think one ha sometimes it happens that the vestry thinks of themselves as the as advice to the rector or the spiritual end, and they don't necessarily think about the financial part. Um, I'm going to say something here that will probably ruffle a few feathers, but I think that every vestry member should be able to read the financial sheet, and I'll talk about that and uh, about how to do that in a little bit. But I think that that is important for them to get a good look at that. So numbers, why do you need to know the numbers? Numbers don't tell the whole story, but they're a part of a story. They're a big part of the story. And they can tell you that if someone has stopped giving or someone is giving a whole lot more, that's a sign that you need to pay attention to. It's a sign of health sign of growth, or maybe not. And so it's important that you look at those numbers and compare to where you, st you stood a year ago, three years ago, five years ago. Um, one of the things that is being talked about among uh, diocesan people is that 2021 is going to become the new benchmark. We're not going to be able to really compare ourselves to 2019 um, because of COVID in 2020. So just this year is kind of a, a year of gathering numbers together so that you can look at where you are next year. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about your numbers in compared to 2019 because that world does no longer exist. And so we got to go forward with that. Numbers represent people. And that's an important thing. I always laugh when some super spiritual person tells me that they don't care about the numbers. Sounds great. But if you ask any, any uh, how many kids or grandkids they have, they don't respond, oh, I don't know, whatever God gives me and sends to my house. No way. You know how many kids you have. You know how many grandkids you have. You know their names. You may not know all their birthdays, but you do know their names. Uh, the number is important because the number represents a person. And that person is important. So I don't ever think of numbers as being um, kind of objective or having no emotional value. They do. They really do. And they represent people. Numbers give you a snapshot and look at your health. And the analogy is that in the hospital, they come in at all hours of the night, making sure that you don't get a good night's sleep to check your blood pressure, to take your temperature, take your pulse. And... That's the idea. We look at numbers, those numbers to determine the health of the patient. So the same thing is true of the numbers and they can help us determine some of the health. It is one indicator of health in a parish. It's not the only indicator of health and what you measure you act will actually do. And I think this is an important thing is what you're counting and what you're looking at is what's important and it's so simple but it's powerful what we measure is what we actually do and what we and so you can have all kinds of numbers that if you don't watch them then you're probably not actually doing them so what is the one principle to brook proof your budget are you ready here it is Budget 90% of last year's income. I think that, as I said, this is not rocket science, but it is prudence. And I think it comes, um, it's, it's the way to make sure that you're not budgeting more and you can deal with things as they come up if you budget 90% of last year's income. Now, why won't you do it? People will ignore the numbers. You create a budget based on emotion or, and you wonder why it didn't work. 
you feel like your church is going to receive more money than it did last year. But the numbers don't lie. And they and you need to have a projection of three to five years. Um, as I often say, hope is not a strategy. Ignoring the numbers while you're skimping by week to week is like an overweight person who refuses to get on the scale. Or someone who's trying to lose weight but's not counting calories or at least counting, looking at what they eat. We over-spiritualize it. No matter how smart the principle sounds, there will always be a group of people who say we need to create a faith budget. And yes, God is in control and God may do want to do more in your church next year, but it's not a sign of faith to commit to salaries, mortgage payments, more. That's just simply bad leadership. If you budget 90% and God blesses you, more than that, awesome. Then you have something to do on it. And you should be planning on what you do if you have more money. Um, looking at the number one thing that most churches don't budget for, which is maintenance and uh, maintaining their facilities. They try to get by and scrape on that year after year or do it on the cheap. And the reality is, um, according to the most uh, recent survey I read or re read was that for every dollar you don't spend on preventive maintenance, it will cost you between two and three dollars later when it does go bad. So even if you have to spend a thousand dollars now, it's better than having to spend three thousand dollars later. So keep that in mind. The number one reason people will not agree with this principle but do nothing about it is we can't afford to do this. We just can't afford to do this. We're just barely making it by. And I know the diet in this diocese in particular, there are lots of churches that are just running on shoestrings and running near the edge. But the reality is you can't afford not to do it because if you get caught, then, you, then you're gonna have to make some painful decisions where, and you'll have to make them in a, without having had some intentional planning and some thought process that goes into it. You're thinking, budget is now nine grand, but it's probably a safe thing to do, but I don't wanna cut. It's not worth it. Well, if you don't cut and you continue to, and you work on your feelings, you'll end up overspending or reacting poorly when we done. But when you keep track of the numbers, you keep your finger on the progress, you're much more likely to end up where you want to go and be there. It's really hard to face the realities sometimes. And I think that while science tells us that gravity is the most powerful natural force in the universe, God is of course absolutely the most powerful force, but gravity is, I believe the most powerful force in human organization is that of denial. Of, not, of denying what's right there in front of us, not looking at the numbers and seeing them for what they are. And numbers can be good, they can be bad, but they, are, they do tell us something about where we are and where we're going and how we want to get there. And if we can get there at this point, there are four steps to uh, making sure you Book, uh, broke proof your budget. One of those is to make the decision to do this before you ask how. In other words, you say, we are going to budget 90% of our uh, income from last year. That's what we're going to do. Then, then you get to look at, then you begin to, how are we going to do that? But you have to make that decision first. And that is an emotional decision and it's a spiritual decision, and it is a hard decision to make. It's even more harder to follow through, but it's the one you have to make first. Then you know you need to know the right numbers, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then I think the thing that happens many times, especially um, with lot, lots of people, uh, lots of parishes, is they don't engage others. A few people try to make the, the decisions all by themselves. And I think 
it's important that you engage with others, talk to them, find out what your parish thinks is important. If you tell your parish, we're only going to uh, budget 90% of our, bud our income from last year, if there's one thing that you can't be cut or one thing that has to happen, what is it? And that will give you an idea of where you could go because the other part of that is you're going to need to cut stuff. And that is one of the hardest things. And I think that goes back to an idea that budgets are seen in many different ways. And I talked about this in a previous webinar that budgets are sometimes seen as set in stone. Budgets are guides and they are guardrails. They are not absolute certain. You don't have to spend everything in the budget. You don't have to spend every, you don't have to worry about going over. One of the things I tell parishes all the time is that if you have a line item in the budget that's going over, let's say you decide to do a vacation Bible school and the budget goes over and it's like $300 over what you budgeted. What happens a lot of times is, well, we'll, we'll just take that out of this other area that we haven't uh, we haven't spent that money and we'll, we'll just assign it to that area. I encourage you to assign it to the Vacation Bible School and just say that this budget item went over this year. That way you have more realistic numbers for next year when you budget your Vacation Bible School because vestries change every year, memories change, treasures change, all of that kinds of things people don't remember. And so they say, well, last year we budgeted $500 for Vacation Bible School and it, you know, so we'll budget that again. When in actually the year before you'd spent $600. So you need to know those numbers. And then you'll also, by engaging others, know where you can cut stuff. What is it that maybe we can do without? One of the things that I think we've learned during COVID is that maybe we don't need to have all of those pew sheets and print all that paper that we've had in the past. Um, the parish that I serve at this time, Holy Communion, is more than likely we're not ever going back to pew sheets um, because we can announce the numbers. People are fine that just as helpful and it's, it saves us you know, not a lot of money, but every little bit helps here and there. So what are the right numbers? Here are the right numbers. You need to know overall giving. You need to know per capita giving. You need to know what percentage is given digitally. The reason I'm saying that is two things that are becoming apparent in my conversations with Chase Bank with regard to the diocese is that they are asking us to go more and more digitally and, and issue less and less paper checks because paper checks can be hacked a lot easier than digital. Believe it or not, paper checks are not as safe as digital giving if you've done it, if you've set it up the right way and you're not clicking on someone from Nigeria who's going to give you $10 million. Um, that is important. But the other part about uh, if you have an ACH, which is an automatic deposit from someone, is that that money is is given on a regular basis, whether they attend or not. And I think during 2020, during the pandemic, we've learned that if, that if we were relying on people to bring their checks every week, they didn't, and we lost some of that giving. So moving more and more people to digital giving is important. Um, I think that uh, especially for younger generations uh, under 40, uh, they don't write checks. They don't even know how to write a check. Most of them, they use digital, they use their phones, they use Vimo, and those things, while sounding to many of us as complicated, they're not really that complicated. I'll give you an example. Church of the Holy Communion is, has a farmer's market, and we have a square, and so we run credit cards digitally and every day, and that has helped our sales um, and some of our activities easily for people who didn't, because some people would go, well, I don't have cash and I didn't, I don't have enough cash left. I didn't have checks. Can you, will you take a credit card? 
And if you come to Lake Geneva and you go to the farmer's market, be prepared for them mostly to want you to give them your credit cards. Uh, so that's an important idea. The other is first time givers. That's an important marker to know how many people have gone from not giving to giving something. We usually want them to become the average gift in a parish, but that's not true. It's a huge step to go from nothing to something. And according to most of the research that I've read, it takes three to five years to get a new, t a new person in the parish up to what we would, many of us would call a realistic or a, a, a giving level. Um, if you've never given any time in the past to a church and you give $10, that's huge. That's huge. And you need to make sure you're aware, uh, aware of that. And also to say the other part, to say thank you. Uh, we forget to do that sometimes. Another right number is the breakdown by ages. Uh, the average age of an Episcopalian at this point in time is 56. The average age in America is 34. There's a great difference there. Um, the baby boomer generation uh, has the greatest amount of wealth that has ever been accumulated in the history of the world. Hopefully they're going to, if, if I have it my way as a boomer, I'm going to spend it all and not give my kids anything. But the reality is that we'll be transferring. And so we got to teach the younger generation how to give, but it also, the congregation, if the, most of your giving is by people over the age of 70, that's not a sustainable future. I hate to break it to you, but none of us on this webinar are going to live forever. Yes, we are with Jesus, but uh, as far as here and giving money to our churches, and also as time goes on, health and co insurance, uh, health costs go up, cost of living goes up, all of those things will have an impact on people's ability to give. So you need to see where you are as, with regard to at w what level and what ages they do. Another <clears throat> part is to, and you'll see it over on the right-hand side of the screen, is something we did at Holy Communion a couple of years ago by breaking down the pledges, which accounted for 80% 80 of our budget. 80% of our budget came from 13 pledges. 19 pledges were uh, made up the other 20%. And that tells you, so you see at the bottom of that little graph, You'll see that we had 32 uh, total pledges for $78,000. Well, if you did the median of that, it was like 3,900. If you did the average, it's like 2,400. But the reality is 20 of our pledges were $700 uh, roughly. And the average of those in the highest group was $5,000. That usually is the case. And we all know that um, it's not anybody's idea that any, it's not new information that 20% support, eight, do 80% of the work, 20% of the people support 80% of the budget. But it is helpful if you know what that looks like in your congregation and what what you can hide. So you see if, if those 13 p pledges units and uh, I can tell you, I know for a fact that 10 of them are over 70. That is not going to be a sustainable uh, giving ratio in the in the next few years. I'm hoping they all live to be 90, but I'm not I'm not going to go there on that. Not going to uh, count on that. Again, it's information. It is not judgment values. It's just information. And it's important that we deal with reality and we deal with the information and the more information and the different, the different ways that you can break it down, help you know what are the right numbers to look at. And I think that's going to be important. It's going to be interesting to see 
just a side note, it's going to be interesting to see what happens this coming year with regard to attendance, because we've been so focused on attendance. Well, everybody's attendance sucked in uh, 2020. I don't know anybody that had great attendance figures. Well, what is that going to look like going forward? And is that a way to keep people? Uh, does the attendance uh, mean engagement? Because you have to deal, if you take that, that nobody came and yet our giving went up from a very few people, it means they're more engaged and saw that. And that some of the people who were actually coming were not as engaged and tied to our, um, to our places as they can. There are two reports, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier. There are two reports that the vestry should receive every month, budget versus actual. That is what was budgeted and what was actually spent or not spent. Um, we can, you could talk here a lot about whether you do the budget by dividing it out by 12 or you try to do the budget by, by seasonal when that expense is made out of the budget. There are monthly expenses that always come out, you know, gas, electric, salaries, those kinds of things. But um, Easter flowers, you don't have to worry about that in November. Um, and so it, you could budget, if you budget it in April, that makes sense. But if you book it out for 12 months, then it looks like you're way over budget for eight of the months of the year, 12 months. Now, this is uh, the treasurers here, the treasurers who are here, this is kind of a word to you, but it's also a word to the wardens and best members. The reports should not be confusing. They should be clear. And I'm wanting to encourage, invite, exhort, whatever you want, word you want to use for vestry members. If you don't understand it, ask it to be explained. If after it's explained, you still don't understand it, then ask them to say it, to explain it again. Make it simpler, as simple as it can be. Um, one of the things that I advise is that the monthly reports to the vestry be very minimal, because I'm hoping you're having a finance committee and other people who are looking at the numbers. Um, I don't think that monthly numbers, weekly numbers are terrible. Monthly numbers are a little, a little better, but quarterly numbers, that gives you a better sense of how things are going. So that monthly numbers should be a very simple budget, income, expenses, things that, and ideas that are items that were unusual, either in income or actual expenses kinds of things. A quarterly budget, I think, should be one where you go into more detail in the budget versus actual and your profit and loss, which is your P&L form, just, and it's a simple form. These reports should not be unreadable, mysterious documents uh, only understood by CPAs. Now, this is where I'm probably going to get in trouble, especially with the treasurers, which is do not give your vestry the QuickBooks printout. Do not give your vestry the QuickBooks printout. That is not helpful. And that is not helpful for them. And it's not helpful for lots of people because they don't know how to make sense of some of the accounting things, especially if you have accrued, restricted funds, um, equity accounts, those kinds of, you're working on uh, depreciation. It should, you are going to have to take an extra step as treasurers and make it in, and do something a little different and make another document that is easier. It shouldn't be that difficult. Um, and I have some examples. If you would like me to send you some, um, uh, Episcopal Church Foundation uh, has a s whole series of articles and templates and suggestions for how one should present thing, uh, a budget to the vestry and to everyone so that it is, is readable and understandable. Side note, just the same thing at your parish meeting. Do not present QuickBooks. Give them a summary budget. I think it needs to be the simpler, the better. Most people can deal with income and expenses with the credits and debits. 
they can't deal with, well, we did this here because this year we took in this money, but it actually went out over here. Um, those, it gets, they don't need to know that. That's important. All right. Finally, some last thoughts. One is know your why before you decide your what or how. Why are why do you exist? Why do you do the things you do? I think this this last year has allowed us to begin to look at the whys, not just the hows, the whats and hows, but why are we a church? Our job is to connect people to God, to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. If you take the Great Commission, go into all the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing the name from Matthew 28 and the great commandments of love your neighbor and love yourself, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and body and love your, and love your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? Why, which one of those are you going to focus on? Why are you doing what you're doing? Second is you should pray. I think that finance committee meetings should, uh, ideally start with some kind of Bible study or dwelling in the word or some kind of prayer time, just saying the daily devotions for individuals and families found in the prayer book or even a whole evening prayer or morning prayer, something to remind you that yes, what you're talking about is business, but we're also, our purpose is a little different. We're not here to make money. We're here to be good reason. Um, stewards of the things that God has entrusted to our care. And lastly, I would think, I would suggest, and this is not feasible for everyone, and I understand that, but that you outsource your bookkeeping. And the reason I say that is, let's be honest, firing people is not easy. However, from time to time, it has to be done. And in the church, we're not very good at it because we're talking about relationships. But it's easier to fire someone who's not internally connected to your organization. And with the, during this past year, there has been a rise in a number of online sources, outsourcing venues like Belay and non -for, uh, numbers for nonprofits who can take care of this the bookkeeping that you have. And if you don't like them, you can fire them. And there's not the kind of emotional angst and uh, anxiety and shall we say church trauma that takes place over the bookkeeping. Um, and the other part of it is if you do your job right and find somebody who knows what they're doing, it also saves you some legal headaches down the road. Um, so you know that you're doing exactly what needs to be done. And it's hard for a volunteer to keep up with all the changing things that uh, in the financial world. Just, an exa uh, just one example is last year with the PPP loans. Those rules were changing every day, almost every hour, uh, up until the time that they opened it up. And so... It, if you weren't following that recourse all the time, you didn't know exactly what you're doing and you could have gotten turned down or you may not have followed all the rules that eventually came into being. And with that, I will set, ask for questions and see what we've got. I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll go from there. Huh. There was there any questions, Sarah, in the chat that I need to that I need to answer? A couple of comments, but no no questions. Okay. Um, Is there any? Do you want me to read them? No. Uh, sure. Yeah, read the ones that. Okay. At Zion has been uh, budgeting ninety percent of pledges, so because they're in a growth phase that that is following your tenants and the best rate right. Matthew spent most of last summer working on their budget, which is no easy task. And yes, cut out uh, $30,000. Uh, 
Uh, I see Eric agrees with me about the uh, Eric. I did not hire Eric, by the way. He is not on my payroll yes. um, because he's sick. Saying actual expenses versus dividing by twelve, and that electronic giving helps. Um, yeah, and I, I, I just want to make a distinction that you know I think that budgeting ninety percent of last year's budget can be a little bit misleading, but if you budget, you know, only a percentage of your forecasted income, it can put you in put you in good shape too. It's just, it's a slightly different approach. Right. Yeah. I, well, and I think uh, yes. I, Pledges, I think pledges are, you know, depending on where you are in your growth cycle and all of that, either one of those uh, ideas, it's the same, essentially the same idea, budget night, less money than you actually expect to get or that you got. So that, that's basically the idea. Uh, Sarah, Kirkland. Sarah, what's the most economical way of electronic giving? And they use a program that charges a percentage of each donation, and that's the case for every single one. Uh, that's just a good, um, you can, you can, there are a ton of online givings. The one that I think is the cheapest and the most reasonable is Tithely, T I A T -A dot L Y. Um, Sarah, you could probably type in, you know, that uh, link. They do a really good job and they're really easy to work with. Um, you know, you can always do Square um, if you want to set up a kiosk. Uh, I know a couple of churches that have set up an iPad. Square will send you a little iPad kiosk that you can swipe cards through. I thought about maybe that those should be on the end of each pew and that you can't get into the pew until you swipe your credit card. Um, you don't want me to be a rector. Uh, but that it, Vanco is another good one. They're, they're, the, ones that, uh, the ones that that are out there, it really is, I would check with your bank, see which one they recommend because that'll make it easier in coordinating with your checking with your bank accounts. Um, but there's all different kinds out there. I, I just, I would go with ease of use. Um, they're all going to charge you between one and 3%, depending on what kind of uh, overhead that they're, they're working with. The reality is, and I know that people get bothered by that, but the reality is you're still going to get 97 cents out of a dollar. And you might not have gotten that dollar before. And I, and I think that's really, that's the main, the main purpose of uh, trying to get that online giving. Also encouraging your congregations to do direct, your members of the congregations to do direct deposits, H-A-C-H. Um, those really, that doesn't cost anybody anything. It just uh, usually is a matter of you calling your bank and telling them that that's what you want to do. So, and getting the routing and uh, account number from the treasurer. So, uh, I am in the process of trying to work on doing that for the diocese for assessments. Um, I've had a uh, going forward so that you all can just deposit your money in our your in the assessments at your convenience one of the things i don't want to do is for us to charge you but rather to let you make the deposit to us when it's the right time of the month for you because we all know that cash flow is an issue going forward uh, uh okay Yes, that's absolutely. a really good question. If you did miss the um, conversation with Jill Heller, she gives a lot of important information on that one, and you can find that that video. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's an important one, and that's one that I, I really recommend you contact Jill Heller, the Trustees Funds Endowment, because they've got a brokerage set up account just for that very purpose, and they can make it very easy. So that that works. Other questions, uh, comments. 
ideas, disagreements. I mean, anybody find anything? I'm hoping I offended you at some level, but you know. So, Father Kevin. Yes, um, Caroline. I completely agree with your advice around simplifying financials to vestries and that QuickBooks typically exports a lot of detail and vestries just do not want to see it. It's, it's just not helpful. It, and in fact, when I used to do that a long time ago, vestries just didn't even look at it. So it's definitely worthwhile summarizing to a one pager showing here's what we've you know here's what our year to date actuals are this is budget this is prior year if that's relevant with some good comments around what what's going on and leave it at that something that they can print out on a you know pdf one page and leave it at that because if you give them more than that it's just really too much to ask from people oh thank you thanks caroline it says the person who writes her own macros for excel like so <laughs> Except not for the best tree. <laughs> yeah, 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 not for the best tree. Good, good. Uh, I would add into that same sentiment. It's I think it's um, important not to look at your if you've got an endowment. Don't spend a lot of vestry time looking at that any more than I would say once a year. But if you do it twice a year, I guess that's okay. But I've seen some situations where the the endowment value shows up on every monthly statement and oh, i just gosh. think it's a big distraction that's because we're required to post it in our general ledger yeah i think that's that's sort of the difference between the general ledger discussion and and financial documents you prepare for vestry for for sort of managerial discussions i i'm not trying to suggest that we don't post it but i think if you're preparing a document for managerial discussions i think the the, the endowment value can be a distraction To that Absolutely. point, let me ask a question for planning. Our church has been fortunate where in past years, we have received two large state gifts that we weren't planning for at all. That helps carry through. I know you don't want to live off the endowment, but it's carried through during lean times. And to uh, Kevin, your point with 20 of the people giving 80% of the money that tends to be with age. Age tends to accumulate the wealth over a long period of time. A new family coming in can't meet at my age, the giving that I give. I'm not bragging, but that's just life. It right. has to do with age. What, what thoughts do you have in trying to solicit estate planning? Oh, um, I've talked about this earlier, but I think absolutely, I think that the parish, um, one of the th primary times uh, I've done it in the past is on Shrove Tuesday in getting uh, ready for Ash Wednesday, because it's, a, you know, that just makes a natural planning for end of life, estate planning. And also, I think that we miss out a great deal on uh, recommended minimum disbursements for those who are over 72. RMDs, as they're known, uh, you didn't have to take yours in 2020, but you will have to take it in 2021. And if you have it sent directly to the nonprofit, you get a little bit of a tax break on it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that on a regular basis, um, I think that on a quarterly basis, there should be something in the newsletter, the bulletins, whatever you use communication wise to talk about, have you thought about estate planning? Have you thought about um, uh, RMDs, especially in September and October? I try to send out um, a letter with a pamphlet that I have that I'll be glad to share with you to all my members who are over 70 to ask them to consider sending us their RMD. Um, also, one of the things that uh, we encour I encouraged this past year was those people who who got uh, stimulus checks, if they didn't need them or didn't, you know, or maybe they didn't want them, you know, for whatever reason, um, to think about giving them to the church. And I had 
three or four parishioners who send us their um, stimulus checks, which really helped. <laughs> you know, every little bit helps. So I think there's lots of ways um, to think about that. But I, I agree with you. The estate planning, I think that should, needs to be um, forefront. If you listen to NPR or any of those places, they're always talking about it. So I, I think we need to talk about it too because people love their church and uh, want to see it continue on after them. And I think that would be a good a good. PR just to have it set up on a regular basis to include it and have the rector make an announcement about it as well. Mm-hmm. Could Kevin, could you forward us with a gang mail your MD distribution letter that'll save sure. time for reconstruction? Because time time is hard for all volunteers. Right. Absolutely. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, I'll make it a list and we'll make a, we'll put it on the resource page as well Perfect. Uh, for the diocese. Yeah. Um, by the way, Doug, it's not mine. I stole it from somebody else. So <laughs> I, I creatively borrowed, let's shall we say, from someone else. And I encourage you to creatively borrow from as many people, whatever you can, Absolutely. wherever you can. Other questions, thoughts, comments? If not, this is 7.55 and I think we're, I'm ready to, I have to go water some plants for my wife who's out of town. So um, I, I love you all and I think you're wonderful, but I really like my house and I wanna stay in it. So I think I'm gonna say goodbye and go water plants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time Thank to you. join us. We'll be back in September. We'll do one in September. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. on your appointment. Thank Thanks you. Yes.